Welcome to the Fifth Estate. Today we take a look at the Joint Strike Fighter, the F-35 for Canada. Al, I turn it over to Grover. Hello, boys and girls. It's Grover. Today, I'm going to talk about the F-35. But first, I am going to turn it over to Janice, who talked to a man whose name is Pierre. So if the F-35 is not a fine combat uh, plane, what about uh, as uh, support for troops, air support? That's the most laughable of all, because to support troops, you have to be able to get in close, to maneuver, to find really difficult to find camouflage targets, and you have to be able to stay in the vicinity of the troops for four to six hours. You have to be able to loiter in order to really give them all day cover when they need it. I am sorry, boys and girls. Your parents wouldn't like the terrible violence that you see. You know, they say the A-10 is good for close air support. Yeah, I can think of something that would replace it. What's that? The F-35! <laughs> it's not that there's a glitch that suddenly arrived and said, oh, we were going to have a gun, but we don't have one now till 2009. They never even planned to have software that could make the gun work until 2019. This is probably part of the overall disaster of the software. This software is in so much trouble because it's so complicated. It's eight million lines of programming code. And they're so far behind on schedule, it's amazing. Since the beginning of the software engineering, every year they've been losing six months of schedule. When you look at the things that fail on this airplane, you realize this airplane has been designed by newbies. I mean, classic things that people have known how to do since the 1930s, like the tail hook. I mean, these are not high-tech, cutting-edge stuff. They don't work on this airplane. You know, he's really funny, that Pierre Spru, I mean, uh, that Pierre Spray, or whatever his name is, I really should learn to pronounce his name. Well, don't bother now. After this embarrassment, he'll probably end up changing it. <laughs> so you're telling me it's a bad airplane, it, it can't do dogfights, it can't protect troops on the ground, it's a lousy bomber, and despite everything that the manufacturer is saying, it's, it's not stealth. Completely correct. So what is the point of this plane? The point is to spend money. That is the mission of the airplane, is for the U.S. Congress to send money to Lockheed. That's the real mission of the airplane. And I guarantee you, by the time all the failings of the F-35 have come to light, if Canada is still buying it, they'll be paying $200 million plus. $200 million? Oh my goodness gracious, that's crazy! Well, we've certainly had enough with Pierre Spray. I think it's time to turn it over and listen to what David Axe has to say. David, take it away. Ah, splendid, splendid, David. Always on the ball with every F-35 opinion you have. Thank you. And now it's time to turn it over to Don Bacon, another self-appointed F-35 expert, to give us his point of view. Wonderful. I don't think the F-35 has ever been quite accurately put into such terms and criticisms. Okay, boys and girls, now it's time to go talk to Pierre Spray again, so he can explain to us about why the F-35 is $200 million. Well, hold the phone there, Grover. We're now just getting information that the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the version A, is actually $108 million. That means the cost of the F-35 in the U.S. will shoot up beyond $300 million, maybe $350 million. So Pierre Spray thinks that the F-35 is $350 million. Let us count. There is the one hundred million dollars. Ah, ah, ah. There's 
two hundred million dollars. Ah ah ah. There's three hundred million dollars. Ah ah ah. There's three hundred and fifty million dollars. Ah ah ah. But one hundred and eight million dollars is not three hundred and fifty million dollars. Ah ah ah. So I guess either Pierre Spray is very smart, or else, if he's really, really stupid, then I'll turn into a duck. Now that's talent! Pierre Spray is going to tell us that VTOL sucks. I wonder if there's anything else he can tell us. Yes, he's a really stupid idiot. <laughs> It's a huge burden in the design of an airplane. As soon as you design an airplane to have a capability to take off vertically, you've basically doomed it forever to be a bad fighter. And I predict that before the airplane is deployed, the major variants of it will not have VTOL, if it's deployed at all. If people by that time are so uninterested in war that they don't care what the airplane carries or how well it maneuvers, then maybe they'll buy it as is and just have another hopeless airplane like the Harrier. The plane, which few would have chosen to depend upon in war, had proved itself. As a fighter, the Sea Harrier had shot down 23 Argentinian aircraft without losing a single plane in air combat. A further nine Argentinian aircraft had been destroyed in ground attacks. In its unparalleled versatility as a fighting machine, the Harrier was now established as far more than jack of all trades. It was truly the master of them. <laughs> you know. That pure spray is really good at putting down the Typhoon, the F-35, and the F-22. Well, don't worry about it now. After this, he'll probably claim he designed them. <laughs> Yet Gates points out that the F-22, designed for air-to-air -air combat during the Cold War, has yet to carry out a single mission in either Iraq or Afghanistan. You know, if you had an airplane that cost $350 million, uh, I don't think you'd want to put it up in Iraq where a 50 caliber machine gun might shoot it down. Remember, these airplanes are extremely vulnerable. And one rifle hit and the whole thing's on fire. They're very unsurvival, very unsuited to anything in an air-to-ground environment and trying to attack the ground. This is very strange. Pierre Spey is talking about the F-22 about being a bomber, but it's an air-to-air -air fighter. What is he talking about? If Pierre Spey really is dumb, I'm going to be hit in the head with a big weight. An Ivy Leaguer with a reputation as a systems genius. He was recruited to the Pentagon in the 60s and became a member of the legendary Fighter Mafia, a band of in-house rebels that set out to prove good fighters don't have to be expensive. In the 70s, the Air Force, the apple of its eye was the F-15. Two-engine, great big fighter for its day, close to 50,000 pounds, super big radar, all the bells and whistles that had gotten too loaded up with junk. And so we went off and as kind of bureaucratic guerrillas, an underground started the F-16. Which was by comparison what? Which was going to be less than half the size, half the cost, and much hotter. It was going to just wax the F-15. And it did. The F-16 would become the most successful fighter in U.S. history. Did you hear that? Yes, another reporter is saying the F-16 was designed by Pierre Spray. Yeah, it's hard to feel bad for him. Now the F-16 is the property of Lockheed Martin. <laughs> this program, the claim is made that Pierre Spray helped design the F-16. The truth is, he was only the lobbyist for lightweight fighter mafia. He simply issued the requirements, as he was advised, for the lightweight fighter program, such as Dimensions for Speed. X amount of G's. Acceleration. He is not an engineer. As soon as you go to design a multi-mission airplane, you're sunk. As soon as you try to make the airplane do close support, air-to-air, uh, -air, deep interdiction bombing, and to carry a whole long laundry list of technologies as long as my arm, you're sunk. You'll never get a good airplane out of that. You'll get a kludge, you know, that will fail you know, time and time again. Because of stealth, it's designed really to carry the weapons internally. 
right? You can't hang weapons under the wing and still be invisible to radar. So according to Pierre Spray, you have the weapons inside so you can remain stealthy or invisible to radar. Well, the first thing to know about stealth is that it's a scam. You know, it simply doesn't work. I don't understand. He just said that stealth, you put the weapons inside to maintain invisibility, and now he's saying that stealth is a scam. Pierre Spray just contradicted himself. You know, that Pierre Spray is so old now, he listens to eight tracks, and he listens to old records on a turntable. I wonder if he's any good for anything. Oh, yes. He could sit up here with us and make stupid jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, boys and girls. That is all we have for you today. Obviously, Pure Spray is full of nonsense and doesn't know what he's talking about. Next week, join us for the Fifth Estate. We will look at whether or not it would be better for our members of Parliament to smoke marijuana. Until then, cheerio! Yes, it's over. How'd you like it? I don't know. I slept through the whole thing. Well, you didn't miss much. <laughs>